Uh, okay, so let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is a new assistant professor. Uh, I think you'll be hearing a lot about her in the future. Her name is Hopi Hoekstra from Harvard. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. <laughs> so Hopi's talk today is Good Dad, Bad Dad, uh, the Genetic Basis of Parental Care. Welcome, Hopi. Um, great, thank you. As you can all tell, I'm not a new assistant professor as much as I wish I was. Um, so first I want to thank the organizers for inviting me um, to this meeting. Um, I'm really excited to present to you some really new work that's been going on in our lab just the last few years. So all the work I'm going to tell you about is um, unpublished. Uh, and uh, where we're trying to identify genes that are involved in behavioral variation in natural populations. So before I begin, I want to make sure to acknowledge um, this outstanding postdoc in my lab, uh, Andres Bendesky, who is really uh, responsible for all of the work that I'm going to um, tell you about today. He's the real driver of, behind this project. So our lab is largely motivated by this question, what are the DNA base pair changes that give rise to differences in traits that are responsible for fitness differences, that is, um, affect the way that organisms survive to reproduce in their natural habitats. Now for many groups this represents the end point of a research program, but for us it represents just the beginning because armed with the genes in hand we're then able to ask more mechanistic questions. So for example we can start to probe both the ultimate and proximate mechanisms underlying evolutionary change, both uh, why these uh, traits evolved and also how they evolved. In recent years, there's been a lot of successes in making these connections between gene genotypes and adaptive phenotypes, but the vast majority of cases that we have at hand involve morphological change. And just to give you um, some examples, here are some cases in our um, own lab, but clearly there's a lot, uh, many more cases from other groups, but we've been able, even in non-model um, species, to identify genes and even mutations involved in camouflaging um, color in natural populations of mice and understand both how and why those changes have evolved. We've also been working on skeletal traits, so identifying, uh, again, genes that give rise to differences in tail length that are associated with um, an arboreal lifestyle where mice that have uh, colonized forested habitats have evolved longer tails. And then finally, um, and most recently, we've been able to identify genes that contribute to differences in sperm morphology, which in turn affects sperm swimming performance and ultimately reproductive success. So while we have a growing number of examples of connections between genotype and phenotype for morphological characters, we have many fewer involved in behavioral differences. Now arguably one of the most interesting behaviors, at least to me, uh, is social behavior. So social behavior is clearly a hallmark of human biology and dysfunction in social behaviors can have dramatic effects on human health and society more generally. Um, but arguably, we know very little about uh, differences, the genetic basis of differences both among individuals and between species and social behavior. Now, depending on your perspective, uh, one could argue that GWAS studies have had limited success in identifying uh, genetic regions associated with uh, differences in social behavior among human populations. So folks have also been studying uh, this question in um, model systems like laboratory mice, which of course are armed with a wealth of uh, genetic tools. I don't need to convince this audience. Um, but the limitation in laboratory mice, of course, is that the differences even among divergent inbred strains are not that large in social behaviors. And so as a complement, folks have turned to non-model systems or non-traditional model systems like bulls, which have extreme differences in social behavior and in particular affiliative behavior. But the limitation in this system, of course, is that these differences occur in species that are highly divergent and so they're no longer interfertile, and so that limits our ability to use forward genetics. So as a complement to all of these systems, our lab has been developing a, um, a new non-traditional model system with its own pluses and minuses, and that is deer mice in the genus Paramiscus. So while to many of you this will look like a typical mouse, in fact, these guys fall outside of the split between our standard mouse and rat models, which if we estimate are about 10 million years diverged, Paramiscus fall about 25 million years outside of that uh, divergence. 
So they really represent their own unique evolutionary lineage, and we can learn new biology, I think, that we um, wouldn't learn by uh, studying just lab mouse and rat. But at the same time, they're closely enough related that we can borrow that wealth of um, genetic and genomic tools and apply them to our studies in Paramiscus. So like laboratory mice, paramiscus can be um, brought into the lab, reared in captivity, and, and in this case, we can do nice controlled behavioral experiments. Our lab, um, along with others, have been building uh, molecular and genetic resources for paramiscus. So for example, we have uh, two new whole genome sequences and have been working on uh, transgenesis in these mice. But unlike laboratory mouse or their wild equivalents, these mice um, are non-human commensals, and they're found in a wide diversity of habitats. So we can go out and trap them in the uh, deserts of Arizona, the plains of Nebraska, the beaches of Florida, one of our favorite field sites, um, where they're at high um, abundance uh, in this wide uh, range. And because of this, there's a lot of opportunity for local adaptation, which certainly helps give rise to the tremendous amount of both genetic and phenotypic diversity that we see among these um, mouse species. So one of the most uh, striking differences among these species is um, behavioral differences, and of the behaviors, um, one of the most interesting is um, mating system. So whereas most mammals and, and rodents in particular are highly promiscuous, I'm sorry to say, um, that in this particular group, we see that monogamy has evolved twice in independently in this representative phylogeny of a handful of paramiscus species. And in particular, um, these two species, which I'll focus on for the um, majority of this talk, are closely related and interfertile, yet differ in these mating systems. So Paramiscus maniculatus, for example, is that typical highly promiscuous mouse that, uh, where both males and females will mate with multiple um, partners, sometimes in rapid succession. By contrast, P Paramiscus polyanotus is that rare example among mammals in which it's both genetically and socially um, monogamous. And um, just as a, a quick note throughout the rest of this talk, um, it will be helpful if you can remember that Paramiscus maniculatus is uh, promiscuous and Paramiscus polyanotus is monogamous. So it didn't work out quite the way uh, that we wanted, but nonetheless, remember to invert those. So um, one of the things that's interesting about this difference in mating system is that mating system is highly correlated um, with differences in parental care, and in particular, paternal care. So as I told you, most species are um, highly promiscuous, and what we see in most of those species is that the dads don't contribute much to the um, raising of the offspring. By contrast, in those species that are monogamous, we see that um, dads do contribute, and in fact contribute in the vast majority um, of species. So this then raised the question of these two um, sister species that differ in mating system, do they actually differ in um, levels of parental care? So to address that question, Andres uh, designed a behavioral experiment. Um, and let me just walk you through that. So what he did is he paired uh, males and females together. They mated, had uh, litters, and at day four, five, and six post-birth, he would separate the parents, put an individual parent in a new cage, let them acclimate to that cage for 30 minutes. They were given um, a nestlet and able to build a nest. And then after uh, that 30 minute acclimation period, uh, he would introduce a pup from that parent's litter. So here you're looking at a dad of uh, Paramiscus polyanotus, the monogamous species. So his pup is introduced, he immediately runs over, handles that pup, licks that pup, starts to huddle him, takes a brief break, but then goes right back to it. He'll retrieve that pup back to um, the area of the nest, and pretty much for the rest of the 20-minute um, observation period, will continue to provide care, including uh, handling, licking, huddling, and you saw retrieving. Now, by contrast, the dad from Paramiscus maniculatus, uh, you can see in its 30-minute observation period, didn't do anything with its nest. Uh, the pup, his pup is introduced, it's sort of flailing around, getting cold, lonely. <laughs> the dad watches, he does investigate, handles the pup briefly, but now pretty much for the rest of the trial sits seemingly scared in the corner and interacts very little with its pup. <laughs> so here's what we call a good dad versus um, a bad dad. Now, after that 20-minute um, period, uh, in two-minute intervals, we introduce the remaining individuals from the litter so we can um, then uh, quantify the fractions of pups that are retrieved. 
So using this assay, we were able to start to quantify behavioral differences in the parents of these two species. So next, what I want to do is show you that data. So here, you're looking at nest quality, that first uh, assay that we looked at. And what you can see here is there's a big uh, species difference that Polyanotis, the, monog the monogamous species, uh, both males and females will build nests. By contrast, uh, Maniculatus barely uh, touches that nesting material at all. We see a similar pattern when we look at the amount of time spent licking the pups. Uh, both uh, males and females of Polyanotis lick the pups much more um, relative to the promiscuous uh, Maniculatus. But we also see differences that are not related to species, but instead by, uh, by sex, where mothers of both species are much better at retrieving uh, their pups than the fathers are. And then we also see patterns in which there's a uh, species by sex interaction. And in this case, in terms of minutes spent huddling, you see Polyanotis uh, are better at huddling their pups than Maniculatus, but Maniculatus moms are better at huddling their pups than dad. So the overall picture that we see is twofold. First, that Polyanotis in general are better parents, and moms and dads contribute in general almost equally to parental care. By contrast, Maniculatus tend to be um, worse in terms of parenting, and if anything, moms contribute much more so um, than dads. So we got excited that there were these behavioral differences and then wanted to start to explore um, whether these differences were heritable. So to do that, we, uh, Andres designed a, a cross-fostering experiment where he took pups of the two species, litters of those two species, swapped them so that they were raised by heterospecific parents. Then those pups um, were raised, mated, and we uh, assayed their parental care. And asked, was there a difference in parental care dependent on who your parents were? And what the clear results are is that we saw no significant differences in any of the parental behaviors that we um, measured related to who the parents um, were. So in other words, the parental care provided does not depend on the parental care that they received. So this is in contrast to um, studies that have been done in recent years in uh, laboratory rats. So this result could, is consistent with the idea that these uh, parenting differences are largely heritable, but it could, there's another um, explanation, and it could be that polyanotis pups may be just more demanding in general. So to um, look at that hypothesis, we looked at the parental behavior and uh, recorded that parental behavior and whether they raised their own pups or maniculatus pups versus polyanotus pups. And again, what you see here are these beautiful negative results in the sense that there's no significant difference in terms of the parenting quality of those parents based on uh, the genetics of the offspring. So monogamous mice do not provide more care simply because their pups demand care. So both the um, uh, cross-fostering experiment and this pup demand uh, experiment are consistent with the idea that these differences are heritable. And that then gave us enough confidence to take the next step and try to localize the regions in the genome that are associated with these behavioral differences. So to do that, we did um, a forward genetic cross where we took maniculatus, crossed them to polyanotus, made F1 hybrids, intercrossed those F1 hybrids, generated a large population of genetically heterogeneous F2s, around 800, and then those mice were then mated and assayed for their parental care on the F3 generation. So the first thing I want to show you are just the phenotypic correlations among these behaviors that we looked at. So here, what you're looking at is a number of different behaviors, the ones that I introduced you to earlier. Um, we're separated mothers and fathers, but I hope you can see in general the patterns are very similar. And importantly, they're um, symmetrical across the boundaries, across that diagonal. So boxes that are highlighted in darker shades represent stronger correlations between phenotypes. So the main thing, I, there's two main things I want to point out with this slide. First, it seems like there are blocks of behaviors like huddling, licking, retrieving, and handling latency that seem to be strongly uh, correlated, suggesting that they have some shared genetic basis. But by contrast, other traits like nest quality shown here seems to be largely genetically, or phenotypically, and, and hence genetically independent. And I'll return to these patterns um, later. So the next thing, of course, what we wanted to do was localize in the genome where the genetic regions responsible for these behavioral differences were. Um, I don't think I need to introduce this in detail um, to this audience, 
But to su suffice it to say that we measured the be parenting behavior of all these F2s and then genotyped them across their genome at a number of um, markers, looking for regions of the genome that showed a statistical association between genotype and phenotype as measured by a LOD score. So which regions of the genomes had genotypes that were predictive of uh, the behavioral phenotype? So now I have to remind you that we're working in not laboratory mice, but instead these outbred natural populations, so we couldn't just order a SNP chip to genotype all of these mice, at least in an efficient way. Um, and so we had to come up with a genotyping strategy. So what we did was we combined two different approaches. Uh, one uh, developed in our lab, which is a reduced representation library, a genotype by sequencing approach called DDRAD. Um, with an approach called multiplex shotgun genotyping, which was developed by Peter Andalfato and uh, David Stern when, uh, when David was at Princeton. And the short story is, is what we're able to do is isolate um, a proportion of the genome from all of these 800 F2 individuals, sequence that, um, those regions uh, le using light coverage, and then use a hidden Markov model to uh, infer the uh, missing genotypes. And the, um, the result of this is that we were able to genotype about 800, mark 800 mice at about 400,000 markers across the genome for about $10 per mouse. So we had high density um, coverage across the genome, and this allowed us to do things like make the first chromosomal level assembly of the paramiscus um, genome, which of course becomes important when we start to look under our QTL peaks and ask what genes are, reside under those uh, regions. So the next thing, uh, what we did is, of course, looked at this correlation between genotypes and phenotypes and identified regions of the genome associated with differences in uh, particular behaviors. Here I just want to show you a few representative examples. So the top panel shows you a nest quality um, score, our LOD score, and then we're marching uh, along the genome. And what you can see is that there's two regions of the genome that pass that genome-wide significance level, and they affect both mothers shown in red and differences in behaviors that we see among fathers shown in blue. By contrast, latency to handle pups, um, we see first a different region of the genome that's associated with that particular behavior, um, in this case chromosome 5, and that's associated just with the differences in latency that we see in males, but not in females. So I could show you lots and lots of these um, types of plots, but instead I'm just going to summarize those results in this figure here. So here what you're looking at is a number of different behaviors, chromosomes um, shown across the top. And here what we're showing you are LOD scores for males in blue and uh, females in red. And the higher intensity the color, the stronger the LOD score is. So the first thing um, I hope you can notice is that there are lots of regions across the genome that are associated with differences in uh, parental behavior. And then I just want to point out a few um, what I think are the most interesting patterns. So for example, there are some regions of the genome, like the one shown here on chromosome 12, uh, which affect lots of different traits, in this case licking, huddling, and retrieving. And by contrast, there are other regions of the genome, like this one on chromosome 4, that just affects nest uh, building behavior. Now remember, this is consistent with those phenotypic correlations that I showed you earlier. But in addition, um, there are regions like um, this one on chromosome 4 that affects both behavioral differences in males and females, but other regions like this one on chromosome 5, which affects just male behavior. So I think this ge genetic architecture then raises some interesting questions about how, in some cases, do particular genes affect multiple behaviors, and in other cases, you can have genes that affect specific behaviors, and in some cases, sex-specific behavioral differences. So this then um, led us to ask the next question of what are the genes underlying uh, these differences in these QTLs that we identified. And for those of you who have done QTL mapping, we all recognize that um, this sort of represents the easy part. The second part of now narrowing in on candidate genes within those QTLs is the um, most time-consuming and often difficult part, especially in, uh, in mice. And so to try to narrow our list of candidate genes, we decided to complement our QTL approach with comparative RNA-seq. And in particular, we focused on the hypothalamus, both because it's involved, known to be involved in instinctual behaviors as well as social behaviors. And so what we were able to do is dissect out the hypothalamus from both virgin and parent parental animals and ask which genes are differentially expressed between these two species. Then combine that with what we know about QTL and ask uh, which of the genes in particular QTLs also show differential gene expression, and uh, then we would focus on the overlap between those two lists. 
So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on just one of our many QTLs, and that's a QTL associated with nest quality, where we have about um, 500 genes underlying that QTL in a conservative uh, approach. And then when we looked at uh, uh, differential expression in the hypothalamus, there are about 1,500 genes that are differentially expressed, but interestingly, there are only about 20 genes that fall in that overlap between the two, and we focus then on these 20-some-odd um, genes. Of those genes, um, we narrowed it down to our top candidate uh, list here, uh, shown the uh, top five. And just by looking at this list, there should be one gene in particular that stands out, um, and that's AVP, or the vasopressin locus. It stands out for two reasons, both because um, we know the vasopressin and oxytocin pathways have been implicated in, previously in social behaviors, but also because AVP is highly expressed in the vasopressin, and more importantly, we see a, um, almost a threefold difference in expression between uh, the promiscuous uh, maniculatus shown in orange and the monogamous uh, polyonotus shown in green. So the next thing we wanted to ask is, are there, uh, is there evidence for mutations in the AVP locus that give rise to these differences in expression that then uh, in turn may give rise to behavioral differences? So to do that, we looked at allele-specific expression. So again, we um, generated F1s, dissected out the hypothalamus, did RNA-seq on those hybrid individuals, and then simply counted the number of transcripts that come from either maniculatus or polyonotus. And as expected, you can see that there's uh, more transcripts that come from that maniculatus allele than the polyanotus allele in that uh, F1 hybrids, which is consistent with the idea that there's cis-regulatory mutations in the AVP locus, which controls um, its expression. So this got us really excited about the potential role of vasopressin contributing to differences in nesting behavior, but of course these data are just um, correlative. So what we really wanted to do is to be able to manipulate vasopressin levels and actually see its effect on um, nesting behavior. So to do that, we turned to um, our model organism. Uh, laboratory mice and took a chemogenetic um, approach. So here we first took advantage of an AVP Cree mouse that was generated by Catherine Dulek Flab, a colleague at Harvard. Um, and then what Andres did is he developed a virus that contained a designer receptor, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. He could inject that virus into the um, PVN of the hypothalamus, the paraventricular nucleus, and we chose that region because it expresses vasopressin and is also the most highly connected region of the hypothalamus. So um, that virus will now infect all cells, but it will only, that cassette that contains that um, dread receptor will only flip and be expressed in vasopressin-containing cells, and in this case, uh, neurons. So this experiment gives us really nice spatial control, which I can, hope you can see by these uh, images below, where we can um, express this virus in a particular region of the hypothalamus, and specifically in vasopressin-expressing neurons. Okay, so why this designer receptor? So this designer receptor is designed so it doesn't interact with any endogenous ligands um, within the mouse, but, it's, but it does interact with a designer ligand uh, called CNO. And so what that means is that we can inject peritoneally CNO. It will, in this case, interact with a dread receptor, which will inhibit those vasopressin-expressing neurons, and that gives us spatial control. So before I show you those um, results, um, let me remind you of the correlation between nest building and AVP expression. We see a high level in orange of AVP expression or vasopressin expression in promiscuous mice that build little to no nests. So there's an inverse correlation between the amount of vasopressin and the amount of nest building. Okay, so next with uh, our laboratory mice, we could inject them with either um, controls or uh, with the CNO ligand, which will inhibit those vasopressin expressing neurons. And when we do that, we see a shift in behavior, and a shift in behavior in the direction we expect. That is, when we um, repress vasopressin neuronal activity, we can see the mice start building a much more elaborate nest and spend more time building uh, those nests. So this suggests that, indeed, uh, vasopressin can affect nest building behavior in the direction that we um, expected. So just to summarize, what I've shown you here is that taking this non-traditional model species that have these big differences in mating system initially, and then we showed have um, large differences in parental behavior, we were able to use a forward genetic approach to localize regions of the genome associated with these differences. Then using complementary RNA-seq approaches, uh, show, looked at the genes that were differentially expressed in a key region of the brain, narrowing our candidate uh, list.
And then by manipulating our top candidate, we were able to show an effect on the actual behavior um, which is involved. So when we talk about this work, I often get asked the question of, um, were you excited or disappointed that you found this vasopressin gene? And I think that's a fair question because, of course, as I uh, implied earlier, vasopressin uh, pathway and as well as the oxytocin pathway has long been implicated in differences in social behavior. But I always um, uh, reply with two things. First, uh, it is first that uh, vasopressin has actually in fact never been implicated in differences in nest building behavior, so that's a, a new uh, phenotype. But I think more exciting is the fact that when we start to think about the targets of evolutionary change in terms of behavior and the precise genes such as those in the vasopressin and oxytocin pathways that have been implicated, most of those genes, and this is not meant to be a comprehensive list, but those that we felt, uh, cases we felt where there was the best evidence, most of the targets of evolutionary change occur in the neurotransmitter receptors themselves. And in fact, it's long been argued that all the action is going to happen in these receptors because you can change their expression level or where they're expressed, where they're expressed and get very specific behavioral effects. But by contrast, when you start messing with things like ligands, like vasopressin, for example, which name comes from the fact that it plays an important role in the regulation of blood pressure, how do you get around all the negative pleiotropic effects? Not only do we not see differences in the blood pressure of these mice, we don't see differences in any other parental behaviors except that of nest building. So that leads us to um, this exciting sort of next step that I uh, hinted at earlier. Now that we have a gene in hand, we can start to understand how and why uh, this behavior evolved. So for example, how is it that we can change the expression of uh, vasopressin, affect nest building behavior, but not mess everything else up about this particular um, species of mice? And we can also ask questions about how this behavior may have evolved. Is there evidence of natural selection on this gene? Or what is the age of the allele? And are other species that have differences in uh, mating system, parental behavior, or nest building behavior also controlled by mutations in the vasopressin locus? So with that, let me um, make sure to acknowledge the people that did the work that I told you about today. So in particular, uh, Andres Bendesky, the real leader of this project. He got help from uh, an outstanding undergraduate, Young Ming Kwan, who worked with us for four years. Uh, graduate student Caitlin Luarch has been studying uh, nest building behavior in a non-parental context and two postdocs in the lab, Jean-Marc Lassance, Brent Peterson. Uh, the AVP Cree mouse came from the Dulac lab and the genotyping protocol from Peter and David. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I need to hug my kids more. Um, <laughs> if you have a question, please come up to the microphone in the middle. So when you change the level of uh, vasopressin, did you see a change in the mating behaviors? Um, that's a great question. So, um, so, so that's a really nice question. So um, there's two things to say that we manipulated not exactly the vasopressin levels per se, but the um, vasopressin expressing neurons. So that's just a minor point. But when we looked at other behaviors like huddling and licking and so forth, those don't seem to be affected by changes in the, in the vasopressin uh, neuronal activity. Not even the mating behavior? Uh, we haven't looked at mating okay. behavior per se. Okay. Yeah. Just okay. in the assay that I described. But that would be interesting to look at, I agree. Thanks. Hi. Have you looked at imprinted genes and differences in, in their imprinting behavior in these two Yes. Strains. Um, so um, we've been working with Catherine Dulac's lab, who has a long-standing interest in imprinting and the evolution of imprinting. So she has uh, mostly in laboratory mice. And so um, with her and, and her postdoc, we're starting to look at uh, uh, imprinting in these mice. It's very challenging in part because uh, they're outbred strains. So the approaches that we can use in inbred laboratory mice are uh, not easily transferable. It just gets more complicated. But we've thought a lot about this and how these differences in mating system may um, affect, may be associated with the sexual conflict hypothesis in driving uh, differences in imprinting. So I, I was wondering how much of the trait variation you think, or whether you have a sense how, mm. how much of this is uh, correlated with this one QTL? Ah, uh, the PVE. That's a great question. 
Uh, I will have to look back. I don't know off the top of my head, in part because we've studied so many different behaviors. Um, but it's, it was sizable enough that uh, we felt both confident that this was a biologically relevant result um, and, th and, and that we could map it. Um, so, but I don't know the precise number off the top of my head. My postdoc oh. would um, be shaking sure. his head in disgust at the moment. And, and, and then related to it, so, mm -hmm. so because there were other very good candidate uh, genes in that mm -hmm. interval, do you think most of it is due to ABP, or, or do you have others that you think are involved in this? That, that's a really good question. So um, we, don't, we haven't quantified that yet to ask how much ABP actually explains that QTL slash um, behavior. Um, one thing I, I can say is that if you noticed with the, um, cis, the allele specific expression levels, that was a pretty modest difference in um, cis regulatory control. So we think that maybe there are other regions across the genome that are associated with changes in vasopressin that may also be contributing in addition to mutations within the locus itself. So that's a little bit orthogonal to your question. But I don't think what I showed you here explains everything. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, you said that monogamy evolved twice? Yes. So in two different groups, like yes. two different branches. Do you think the results you found here also apply to the other one? Um, that's a great question. We're, we're on that. Um, so we'll, this now, the second species, Paramiscus californicus, is, which has been um, well studied in terms of its monogamous behavior, that's the, uh, the next thing on the to-do list is to look at expression levels and to sequence around that uh, AVP locus to see if we see common mutations, for example. Great, thank you okay. again, Hopi. Thanks.